it, that I'm going to be speaking to you here today is going to piggyback off of that, and it's found in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 1 to 14. And I've entitled this message, Level Up Faith. Level Up Faith. Because we all, we picked up finances. We picked up pledges, finances to finish the, the work of God and to finish the house of God and take care of it. And, and it takes faith to be able to, to, to invest, to make that shift. Especially if sometimes it's new to us. I was sharing with the first service, you know, when I first got saved, you know, I was the problem. You know, because I, I just got saved, came out of, the, came out, you know, my background, you know, and my wife was no problem. Was, oh, they asked for money to give. Oh, yeah, I'll pay my, then pay I said, what's the matter with you? How are you paying? What are you, what are you giving of that? I said, we're on welfare, man. We're barely making it. What are you doing? Do you? <laughs> I was, a, I had to, re, my mind had to be renewed. All renewed. We don't, I was born again. Amen. But the temple needed to be rebuilt. The walls, the broken walls had to be rebuilt. Amen. And so, and I'm the priest of the house. We got to remember, men, we're the priest of the house. It starts with us, right? And this priest wasn't doing too good in the early beginning. Amen. He had to make some changes. But once I made the shift and once I made the changes and we started giving the little, even the little bit that we had in obedience to the word of God, like he says, test me and see if I'll not open the windows of heaven. I mean, I can go on and on with testimony. I tell you, I, groceries were found in our door. Amen. Different ways God opened doors. Even multiplied our gas. You know, the E, enough. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, we always were on that E, enough. Okay, we got enough. Let's go, you know. And God somehow would multiply, amen, those fumes to get us where we need to go. Amen. I mean, simple, crazy little things, but God was always filled. Just like in the wilderness, their shoes never wore out, right? I mean, God always provided for them what they needed. And so, it, but all that takes what? Faith. Faith. So let's look at this story here this morning. And I know that we're not going to finish it. This is going to be part one. And maybe next Sunday will be part two, Okay. But it's going to be part one. So we're going to get started. John chapter 6, verse 1. The word of God reads like this. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs or his miracles or performed those that were diseased. Then Jesus went up on a mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Now, then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, which was one of his disciples, Philip, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, or another version says to prove him, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip answered Jesus and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. Then one of his other disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to his disciples and the disciples to those that were sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up, filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they seen the sign or seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Father, help me now, bless me now to communicate your word to the people that you have here today. I pray that they will receive revelation, insight, uh, a rhema word that will change and transform their, their faith and their life forever. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Level up faith. 
Now, what we find here in the Gospel of John is Jesus doing just that, trying to level up the faith of his disciples. And you, the reason why he was doing that because these disciples were called to be global leaders. Not just local leaders in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, but they were called to be global leaders, to impact the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I said to the first service, I believe that God has called Victory Outreach San Bernardino, you and I together, not just to be local leaders, amen, here in the Indian Empire, but also global leaders. Do you believe that? Throughout our years, we have always invested and planted not only financial seed but also human seed into the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and I mentioned this is why it's important that we want to finish this house finish this temple because I believe that God is not finished with this yet we are just stepping into the second half the second part of our ministry and how many know like in football or games the first half could be good amen but what matters it doesn't really matter what happens in the first half what really matters what happens happens in the second half and I believe we have stepped into the second half of our ministry and the latter is going to be greater than the former that was his promise that was God's promise that he had given to us he says so build my house and I be, that I can take pleasure in it and I can be glorified and the latter glory is going to be greater than the former and he promised that he's going to take care of us and bless us with everything we need to get the job done all it takes is for you and I to believe. All it takes is for you and I to have faith and to believe the word of God. Not the word of a man. I'm just a man. I'm a vessel. Listen to the voice behind the voice. And your life will never be the same again. You know why? Because it's the word of God. Amen. So this is why Jesus took this opportunity to level up their faith because they were called to be global leaders. Each one of them had a powerful and specific assignment in this world, just like many of you here today. And in order for them to be successful and effective, they needed to level up their faith. Come on, tell your neighbor, level up your faith. Because to be a part of God's kingdom in, and to, in, in life, in family, in ministry, we're going to all need great faith. In order to advance the kingdom of God or, or whether the storms of life and the trials of life, especially even in these last days, and to be effective in the kingdom of God, we're going to need great faith. Faith is a key to living a victorious and successful life for a believer. How many believe that? Faith is the most powerful weapon in the life of the Christian. It, it, it can be a powerful weapon for, for defensive purposes or offensive purpose but it's the most powerful weapon that a believer or Christian could ever have and without faith it's impossible to please God the Bible says he that comes to God must believe that he is God the Bible says and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him he says without faith it's impossible to pleasure his heart Unless we pleasure the heart of God, we're not going to see the miracles and the provision and the resources that we need to be successful and productive. We're not going to see the victory in our life when the devil comes. We're not going to be able to conquer him if we don't have the faith in this day and hour. See, without faith, the believer is a dead man. Faith without works is dead, right? In fact, that's why the devil goes after your faith. If there's anything that he wants, it's your faith. If there's anything he wants to take away from it, it's your faith. So he'll always, in life, family, ministry, in the kingdom of God, the devil always trying to assault your faith. He'll assault your faith when he hits your marriage and when he hits your children, when he breaks down your business, uh, when things don't go at this, you, as, as planned, the way you thought it was going to happen. Many times when doors close, you got to always remember God will always open another door. Especially if you're part of God's plan and God's purpose. You're his son, you're his daughter. Man, the devil don't like that. If there's anything he can do to get back at God is to mar and destroy his image. And you and I have been created in the image of God devil's a liar amen? amen Hebrews says in Hebrews 11 1 that faith is a substance of things hoped for 
the evidence, the evidence of things not seen. If I, I, when I talk about faith, I, I tell people faith is believing. It's trusting God with all of your needs and all of your, in all of your circumstances and in all of your situations. Amen? Now, when it comes to faith and trusting God, there are three facts that I always like to communicate when it comes to faith and trusting God. Are you ready? The first fact is this. The fact that God is an omniscient God. You must believe that. God is an omniscient God. What does that mean? That means that God is an all-knowing God. God knows all things. According to the scriptures in Psalms uh, uh, 30, 139, verse 1 to 6, 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, Psalms 147, verse 5, it speaks about the all-knowing God. God, our God, my God, your God, the God that we worship, the God that we serve. He is a all-knowing God. He knows all things. In fact, he knows what you did yesterday. He knows what you did last Friday. He knows where you were. He knows what you did. In fact, he even knows what happened on the way to church today. God is an all-knowing God. He knows all things. Amen? He knows all things. Amen. But this is the beautiful thing when it comes to this fact that God is omniscient, that he's all-knowing, that when you face trials and tribulations, when you face the assaults of the enemy upon your faith, when you go through your darkest hour, your most difficult times of life, family, and ministry, I'm here to tell you that God is not somewhere far away and left you alone. God knows all about it. He knows every detail, what you're going through, what you're facing, what you're battling, what the devil's trying to do. He knows all about it. You're not alone and the other exciting thing about God being all knowing and knowing all about it he also knows how he's going to deliver you how he's going to get you through and how he's going to pull you out because he's an all knowing God he knows all things and that's a fact the second fact when it comes to trusting God and believing God is trusting in the fact that God is omnipotent Omnipotent. What does that mean? That means that God is an all-powerful God. <laughs> God is an all-powerful God. Genesis 1-1, you see how he created all things. In Psalms 33, verse 9, Genesis 1-3, Jeremiah 32, 27, speak about God being an all-powerful God. The God that we serve, the God that you and I worship, he is an all-powerful God. Amen. He, he's the creator of heaven and earth. He created everything that we see, the earth and the, everything in it. He's all-powerful. And the Bible says there's nothing too hard for God. In fact, what may be impossible for man is possible with God. Why? Because he's all-powerful. He's all-powerful. So whatever you're facing, whatever financial situation, whatever sickness, whatever disease, infirmity, whatever challenge or trial of life, difficulty of life, you got to know if God has called you, if God has a plan for you, listen, it's just temporary. I said it's just, you got to learn to trust in the all-powerful God that your mountain, your valley, whatever you're facing, it's not too big for God. It's like David when he faced Goliath. Man, he was a giant, right? And people say, you can't fight that giant. You can't take out that giant. He's too big. Amen. David said, no, nah, he's too big to miss because I got God on my side. God is with me. In fact, when he confronted Goliath, he says, you uncircumcised Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, my all-powerful God. He trusted in that fact that his God was all-powerful, bigger than any giant. And then the third fact that we need to trust in when it comes to believing and trusting God is the fact that God is immutable. Immutable. What does that mean? That means that God never changes. The God that we serve is a God that never changes. He remains the same. Isn't that beautiful? In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, he says, I am the Lord. I do not change. That tells me that if God is an all-knowing God, he's always all-knowing. 
He never changed. He, all, he knows all about our situation and all, all, knows all about our victory. Amen? Way ahead before it even happens. He, and he never changes. He remains the same. If God is all powerful, he's always full of power. He never runs out of power. There's never anything to do because he is God. He never changes. If God is faithful, he remains faithful. If God is loving, he's a, an everlasting loving God. If God is merciful, his mercies are new every morning. God that we serve never changes. And what's good about that fact is, that, is this, that because God is a God that never changes, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whatever you went through yesterday, he got you through it. And whatever you go today, he'll get you through it. And what you go, to, go through tomorrow, he'll get you through it. He didn't bring you this far to leave you. He just wants to level up your faith. So please keep these facts in mind as we move on with our story. Let's go back to the scriptures. Are you ready? So going back to the scriptures, it said, the Bible said, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and then it says, then a great multitude, a great multitude followed him. That, a great multitude in the Greek mean, means a massive, massive multitude was following Jesus. Now, let me just mention something here today as we move on, before we move on. Now, when you read the New Testament, we read it in English, right? But the New Testament was originally written in Greek. You have to remember that it was a time of the Roman Grecian Empire, right? Where Greeks, the Greek, the Greek Greco Empire still had a, a lot of cultural influences. In fact, language, culture, different things, but yet the Roman Empire was the, the, the dominating empire. So the language was Greek. They writ, they writ, they wrote in Greek. So sometime when we read the Bible, we're reading in English. But when you really do your due diligence and you want to read and know what was what was this man saying to these people and what was he trying to communicate? If you want to get the original meaning, many times you got to go deeper. Say go deeper. And, and so when you go deeper, man, it, it begins to blow your mind. You know, the, the English version, the translation of the English version doesn't do justice many times to what was actually happening and what he was trying to convey, you know, to the readers. So this is what I want you to understand. So cause we're going we're gonna to get some original Greek meaning as we go through the, this sermon here today. Is that okay? Yes. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar. <laughs> But I do my due diligence and I do study. And even when I, and I hear preachers, different things, but I always go do my due diligence, do my own study to back up every word. Amen. And so, so as you read this, it says Jesus went to the Sea of Galilee, right? Over to the Sea of Galilee, and there was a great multitude. Well, in the Greek, it means a massive, massive multitude of people were following him. And when it says they followed him, the Greek tense, it literally means that they followed and followed and followed and followed Jesus continuously. In other words, wherever Jesus went, wherever, wherever he, he turned, wherever he went, if it was over to the left or it was to the right or to this city or to that city or this, this village or this part of the city, those multitudes of people would follow him wherever he turned, wherever he went. Multitudes were following him continuously over and over again. And that's in the Greek text that gives us that, 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 that understanding. And the crowds kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger as they followed him. Why? Why were these crowds getting bigger? Why were there masses of people following Jesus wherever he went? I'll tell you why. The Bible says because they saw the signs, the miracles which he performed on those that were diseased. Now, the word saw... The tense is the same as the word following. In other words, it was continuous. So in other words, the people continued to follow and follow and follow Jesus wherever he went because they continued to see over and over again miracle after miracle after miracle. And the crowds kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger because more miracles kept taking place and the crowds kept following and following because they kept seeing and seeing the miracles that were taking place. But there's something more interesting in that word seeing 
Because the word seen in the same Greek word, when you, when you look at the original meaning, it gives you the word uh, or the sense of theatrical or theater, of theater. In other words, it's like the people kept following and following and following him because they kept seeing and seeing and seeing these miracles. It was like, like they, they didn't want to miss a moment. It was like a drama, a theater that was being played out over and over again that they didn't want to miss a moment. They didn't want to miss a miracle. Miracle after miracle was happening, so they wanted to be there to see the next miracle. And it was like a drama a, a theatrical play that was played out. They didn't want to miss one scene. Ever been there? How many ever been in a good play? Good movie, good play, right? And you, you're in it. You don't want to, you might have to go to the restroom, but you don't want to go to the restroom. I don't want to miss a scene. So it gives that, that meaning. So when Jesus performed his miracles here in Galilee, it was one of those most theatrical performances they had ever seen of their life. So people from everywhere just kept coming and coming and coming to keep seeing, seeing continuously, coming and coming to, because they didn't want to miss one moment or part of the show. They want, they want to miss what was happening. And then notice where it says they saw the signs or the miracles which he did or performed on those that were diseased. The word he did, the miracles that he did or performed is a translation of another Greek word which means, or where we get the word, English word, poem or poet, which speaks of a person who has a creative flair or creative ability. A creative flair or creative ability. So what is telling us then it's telling us that when Jesus did these miracles, when Jesus performed these miracles, he didn't just heal blindness. Listen carefully. He didn't just heal a blind or strengthen legs so that people can get up and walk. No, my friend, he didn't just go heal headaches or backaches or, 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 or certain things. But rather, in other words, what was happening and, and rather what the, what, the, what the word of God is conveying or communicating to us that, that there was this creative power that was being unleashed in and through Jesus that Jesus was not just healing blindness but creating eyes. He was not just healing broken limbs but creating limbs. That's, that, that's the, what, what the original scripture is telling us. See, we don't get that. But in other words, there, there was, there, people were following. I mean, I'm telling you, people, that's why there were so many masses of people, masses of people going after him, going, continuing following and following, wherever he went, because they were seeing things that they had never seen. It was blowing their mind. And when people saw this, they didn't want to miss a scene, miss a miracle. That was happening. That's why they just kept on following him and following him and following him. Isn't that amazing? You know, I, I, listen, I, I have faith to believe God for heal cancer. I have faith to believe God to heal diabetes. I got faith to believe God to heal, you know, limbs or, or pain in the back. Or I got faith to believe liver disease, kidney disease, all these, they, God, they can be healed. I have faith to go in the hospital and lay hands on somebody that's there in the ICU and believe God, God, I have that faith. Oh, but my friend, when I started reading this in the original text, my God, my faith went another level. I said, my faith went another level to read about what Jesus was doing in that day. And, now, and the exciting thing is this. Didn't Jesus say, greater work shall you do in my name? Didn't Jesus say that? That, you, that as disciples and followers of Christ, greater work shall you do in my name? And I'm telling you, in this last days, I believe there's going to be an outpouring of God's Spirit because the Bible says it. The Spirit of Elijah is going to be in this day and hour, and we're going to be able to see. If we, let, if we level up our faith, we're, our eyes are going to see the same type of supernatural invading power of God. Do you believe that? Jesus was literally releasing creative supernatural power upon these individuals. Isn't that powerful? So when the people saw this, they didn't want to miss it. That's why a multitude, and the crowds kept getting bigger and bigger. 
Then it goes on to say, they kept following and following him because they kept seeing and seeing these miracles, these signs on those, on those that were diseased. Now that simple little word, on. Notice it says on those. The word on in the Greek is epi, which describes a descending force. A descending force. In this case, it describes an invasion of divine miraculous power that came into Galilee in Jesus' day. It was, at, it was like a divine occupying force that came into that whole region through the ministry of Jesus Christ. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of Matthew 11. Remember when, years ago when I pre preached a message, the kingdom of God suffers violent and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of God suffers violent and the violent take it by force. And many people interpret that in many different ways. But when you study that, what he was talking about, when Jesus began his ministry and began preaching the kingdom of God, repent because the kingdom of God is near. And the Bible says that he went from town to town, city to city, village to village. And the miraculous kingdom power was being unleashed in and through him to, on those that were sick and diseased and captive and oppressed by the devil. They were being saved set free. They were being healed by the power of God. The kingdom of God was so violently uh, shaking up that neighborhood, shaking up that household by his healing power, his delivering power, setting people free. Amen. And just as violently the kingdom of God, when all that divine power was, was moving, people, the Bible, when you study it, it says people, people that were there in the marketplace, people, when Jesus would go by their street corner, then those that were keen enough to recognize that this was a true message of sent from heaven a true move of God just as violently they were pressing into it I'm going to remember sometimes at conferences <laughs> we're at conference we're just having a conference but man some of these men and some of the all of a sudden the altar's open and they're just running violently <laughs> you know I sit in the front most of the time and man I got to move over because there's been a few times in the day that, man, they bumped me, almost knocked me down. <laughs> and I know some, some of them, you know, they just want to get up there in the altar, right? But you can see others, they're running with tears. They're running with tears in their face, and they're so desperate to get at that altar. Amen. And if it means, <laughs> if it means knocking Pastor Elder Rick over, then so be it. I got to get to the altar. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? And I believe that this is going to happen in this last day if we level up our faith. Let's read on. And Jesus then went on a mountain, the Bible says. And there he sat there with his disciples. And then the Bible says the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Now, this event that took place on the, on the side of this mountain they say it was very close to a city called Capernaum, Capernaum, which was known as the city of Jesus. And the reason why Jesus, because Jesus chose Capernaum to be his base of operation. This is where, and it is said that he did, more, most scholars say that most of his miracles, you know, were done in and around Capernaum. It was a, a chosen city. He chose to set up his base camp his base of operation to go out and preach and heal the sick. Now, the city of Capernaum was, was chosen by Jesus strategically. He chose the city strategically to be the place to set up his base of ministry. And the reason why, and let me just show you how many know that God never does things by accident. He, he's very strategic. He does things with a purpose. And the reason why he set Capernaum up as a base camp Strategic because the city of Capernaum was one of the largest cities along the Sea of Galilee. It was a port city, and it was one of the largest cities along the Sea of Galilee. It had one of the largest ports. It was a very rich city, and it was rich. Uh, it was so rich that that the all that the one of the finest synagogues around the region was there in Capernaum. It was one of the largest, it had one of the largest attachments of the Roman soldier uh, camps or post. There was a lot of intellectuals there. 
Capernaum was on the border. It was a city where people would have to pass through to get to Jerusalem. And they had to pay taxes there, and there was a lot of money there. In fact, all the taxes around Galilee was held there in Capernaum. Because that's where, and that's where Jesus found Matthew, the tax collector. So when Jesus chose the city of Capernaum as his base, it was a rich city, a city well located, a city that was filled with an international population, and there was a military, there were military forces there. It has something, you know, I was reading, it reminded me of Frankfurt, Germany. It, it described Frankfurt, Germany. You know, we have a church there now, right? And it was almost the same thing. Frankfurt, Germany, there's base camps, uh, army, military bases all around Frankfurt. It's an international city. It, it's, it's amazing because God never does things by accident, yes. right? So along the side of Capernaum, also, listen to this, was a very important road, which was called the Via Matas. Now, the Via Matas was a road that came down from the city of Damascus on the north of the Sea of Galilee. It came down and it passed through Bethsaida and then through Capernaum all the way down through Jerusalem, down through the Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem. And then if you wanted, they wanted to go, they turned a, a certain way all the way to Cairo, which meant that there was a constant flow of traffic always passing by, which meant Jesus set up a base in a location where he literally didn't even have to go far to reach people. Masses of people were coming to him. He didn't have to go reach the nations. The nations were coming to him. Jesus had become the biggest tourist attraction in the city of Capernaum. Now notice, it says now Passover the feast of the Jews was near. Now they went to the side of a, mill, a hill. He sat down with his disciples. And then the Bible says the, the, feast of the, Pas the feast of the Passover was near. Now the Passover was a very important and special event that took place every year where heads of household would pack up their families and, and head to Jerusalem to celebrate that special day. So you could imagine... Amen. As Jesus is there sitting on the side of the hill with his disciples, they, they could actually look down and see the Via Matas. They could see on the other side of, of the Sea of Galilee on this side, and they literally can see the masses of people, families from all over the region of Jerusalem and all, actually from all over the Roman Empire. Jews had to come and celebrate the past, coming down thousands upon thousands of people traveling down that road, and they can actually see the masses of people going by. The Bible says, then Jesus lifted up his eyes after he was, was sitting there, lifted up his eyes and seeing, there's that word again, seeing that carries the idea of a theatrical or theater. In other words, he started seeing played out right before him like a drama, masses upon masses of people starting to come towards him. Somehow they heard that Jesus was Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, the one that opened blind eyes. Yeah, the one that made the cripple walk. Yeah, the one that cleansed the leper. They were on their way to Jerusalem, but when they heard that he was on that mountainside, they made a U-turn and started coming around, and they started following and going towards Jesus. How I many when you're desperate, <laughs> you're going to make the effort to get to where the miracle's at. Amen. So Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing a great multitude coming towards him. In other words, an, another mass of people started making their way directly towards him. When that began to happen, he seen all these masses of people there. Then he said this. He turned to one of his disciples. He said to Philip, Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Now remember, they separated to a deserted place. They can see the cities, but they were in a deserted. There was no marketplace there was no stores around, amen? But he said, where can we buy bread that these can eat? But this, the Bible says, listen carefully, to test them. He said this to test them. Another version says to prove them or expose him. For he himself knew what he was going to do. Again, Jesus is all-knowing. Now listen, Jesus did not ask this question to get information from him, he asked a question for the person he was talking to and those that were listening around him in order to prove them. 
to test them. And the word prove or test in the Greek language, it means to test something to find out if it's defective. In other words, he did this to, to expose them, to uncover, to reveal. Jesus wanted to expose, reveal, and uncover where their faith really was. They had been following him and following him along with the people. They seen miracle after miracle after miracle. But now he wanted to expose their faith. Expose, really, where are you in following me? Do you really believe who I am, who you say that I am? And he wanted to, because he wanted to make sure that they had enough faith, to, that he could level up their faith because they were going to be world shakers. He wanted to see, it, is it genuine? Because how many know there's a lot of people that follow God. In fact, there was a time that people, that he, when he fed them, people were following, then he stopped and he says, you know what? They're following because of the bread. They're following because of provision. I'm providing for them. See, a lot of people come to church and they follow Jesus for the benefits for the miracle, for the touch, for the healing. Oh, but then when we come like last Sunday and say, okay, after all that, now are you ready to give? <laughs> How many can give 2,000? How can we give 1,000? Oh, then that's where the faith is tested. Uh, we, we all want the benefits and all the privileges, but we don't want to pay the price. Oh, but God was very clear. He says, no, this is a time. I believe because God was leveling, is ready to level up our faith. God used that Haggai, that message, amen, the house, to level up our faith. To dare, we've been seeing miracle after miracle. We've been seeing crowds coming, people coming, families coming, young people coming. God is moving by his spirit. People are getting saved, amen. But how many know it's not just being saved? Now we got to get the saved to level up their faith so that they can have the faith to believe not just for $2,000 or $1,000. That's nothing to God. But to believe God for bigger things and greater things in their marriage, their family, their children, their business, their life, their ministry. Because God wants to use us in a greater way. God wants to do more in us and through us than we could ever imagine or dream. But if we don't have the faith level... We're going to limit God. We're going to limit. I, I don't care if you just came last week. or you, God wants to raise your level of faith. God has plans for you, sir. God has plans for you, man. God has plans for you, young man, and it's bigger than what you could ever imagine. I know it might be new to you, but I guarantee you, if you just trust this word, amen, and listen to the voice that's behind the voice and respond to God in obedience, I'm telling you, you're going to see signs and wonders take place in your life and through your life. He wanted to see if their faith was genuine. Because you would think that all the time that they had walked with Jesus and seen the miracles and all the miracles that they even did by being empowered by God, you would think that like watching a good play and drama, they would have been ready with great expectation when Jesus asked this question to test their faith. I don't know, Lord, how you're going to do it I don't understand. I look at what their situation, but you know what? You're God. You're the prophet. You're the son of God. Amen. So I'm just, you just tell me what I got to do, and I'm ready to see the miraculous. But no, Philip turns around and says, Lord, like what? You know, what's the matter? You know, 200 denarii worth of bread is not, or, or 200 denarii is not enough to go buy food that all these people can eat. A denarii was one, was one day's wages. Can you imagine that? One day's wages was a denarii. He said 200 days wages is not enough to feed these people. You would think that after all they've seen, the miracle after miracle, the blind seen, the lame walking, the lepers cleansed, that they would be amped up, ready to see Jesus do another miraculous supernatural miracle. But no... Even Philip came and says, Lord, there's a little lad here. He has two 
two small fish and five loaves of bread. But he says, but what are they among so many? So Jesus then was asking this question to find out really where their faith was at. He was proving them. He was testing them, exposing where they really are in their faith. Was it defective or was it genuine? And he did this for the purpose of leveling up their faith. And God will always use circumstances and situations and trials and tribulations and challenges like we got the last time I was with you, challenges to give. He will always use all of these circumstances, situations, and challenges and will always try to turn them into opportunities to level us up and level up our faith. He'll use messages like this and messages like last week of building the house to challenge God's people, consider your ways. Especially when we start getting focused on ourselves and focused on our own houses, our own businesses, and, and you know, while God's house is unfinished. And sometimes we even develop that spirit of disinterest or even an indifferent spirit where we're more focused on self, self centered, and self indulgent attitude. But then they were challenged to level up. They were challenged to focus in on the miracle, on the opportunity for God's blessing of a miracle of multiplication and blessing and provision. Hallelujah. They were being challenged. It didn't make sense. Just like some of you, 2,000. What well, that don't make sense, man. You know, but let me tell you something. It's nothing to God. We just said that God, and nothing is too hard for God. God is all powerful, God. In fact, he even said in his word, I own all the silver and the gold. He goes, in fact, I promise you, if you'll be obedient and, and, and take care of my house, he says, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to bless you. In fact, while you have seed in the barn, I'm going to bless you. All you got to do is get the seed out and plant the seed. And all of a sudden, the windows of heaven, well, we don't even have time to get into that right now. My God, because the Bible says then they all ate and were all filled. Oh, that's a whole nother bump. We'll see that next, next week. Amen. Because there's only three times, really, I think it's three times that, that the Bible talks about the heavens opening. Like that, God opening the windows of heaven, or the heavens opening. Then with Noah, the flood, right? And then I think there was another one, and then also I remember then, where the Bible says in Malachi, bring all the tithes in the storehouse and see if I'll not open the windows. And that's, we'll get into that next. That's amazing. But they were challenged to level up. And God promised, and God had given them a promise that even their seed would, that he would bless them. So you see, and we're going to go ahead and I want the worship team to make their way. So you see that through this simple story, there's some power pack insight, revelation in this message. Because I believe that Jesus was doing this purpose. He said, I did this to test them to prove them, to expose, to reveal, to uncover where their faith really was at. Is it defected? Because let me tell you something, if you keep coming and you, keep, you allow your faith to stay defective, the enemy is going to win. Life's troubles are going to win. Certain situations are going to overcome you. Remember, Jesus, don't worry about these things that you're going to eat, wear, all that. We go seek first the kingdom of God because most of us worry about those things. We worry about self. We worry about this. He didn't say don't plan for them. He said don't worry about them because worry will make you sick. Worry will keep you captive. The Bible, a definition of worry is just like, like, a, like an animal seizing by the throat another animal shaking them, mangling, trying to mangle them, put them to death. Another interpretation of worry in the definition is like, is like a, a, a consistent biting over and over again. Like if you disturb the beehive and you got bees all over and they're just biting you and, you know, I mean, oh, well, sometimes you're worrying you're like that. Huh? It distracts you from life. It distracts you from going to work, taking, you know, your marriage, your children. You're just worrying about how am I going to eat? I got to work. I got to work overtime. I got to make money. I got to take care of self. It's about me. Church don't take care of me. They're going to pay my bills. But 
God will. I said, God will. Oh, yes, he will. He's done it for me over and over and over and over again. That's why I keep following him and following him and following him and following him because I keep seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing his signs, his miracle working power, his creative work at work in my life, in my finances, in my marriage, in my children. I see it over and over. That's why I keep on showing up. I keep on giving. I don't stop. I keep on going because he is a faithful God. God is faithful, all-powerful, and he never changes. Whatever you're going through today, listen, the same way he got you through yesterday, he'll do it again today, and he'll do it again tomorrow because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, hallelujah. I want to pray for some people here today. I want to pray for some people and say, you know what? Level up my faith, God. Level up my faith. I dare to believe. I want to see your glory. I want to know you more. Level up my faith. I don't want to stay with little faith. I don't want to stay with just ordinary faith. If you have plans for me and you have called my life and there's assignment for me in the world and, and if I need this faith, then I'm ready. I'm ready to, to place my life in your hands. So the next time you, when you leave this place and and you, you go to your work, you go to your school, you go pack to church, wherever you go, you're going to always have this sense of expectation, especially when a challenge comes. You're going to look at it and, whoa, but then you're going to shift and say, wait a minute, this crisis, this challenge, this is an opportunity. God probably is getting me ready to, to bless me. He's getting ready to take me another level. So I have to respond correctly to it. I can't panic. I can't doubt. I can't let unbelief set in. I got to trust God. I got to trust God. If that's you here today, we're going to sing a song. And you need God in your life. If you're not saved.